with our 48 volt, the wooden hull boat, sure. um, our charging setup is more of a DIY approach of we've got the ability to connect a battery charger that is a variable supply battery charger. You can set the amperage that you like, you set the voltage that you like, you clip it on, it'll do a constant of uh, amperage, constant voltage charge profile, and it'll, you know, charge the battery. But like one pack or all like so one because bank? it's a 48 volt bank will supply 50 I forget 54 whatever the voltage is I'm forgetting now um, whatever 3.65 times 16 is we would supply that into the battery okay. and then the BMS would usually what ends up happening is that if everything was perfect and all the cells were perfectly balanced together you would finally reach them all at 3.65 volts and then it would shut everything off at once but realistically what happens is because the charge the charge discharge curves of lithium iron phosphate cells are so flat with that sort of flare at the beginning and the end for sure. the charging and discharging when they get close to being full, one of them will ramp up really quickly and hit that threshold, and you maybe could have gotten another 1% or whatever into the rest of the cells. And so at that point, you start to have the balancing taking place and all that's happening. Right. Um, but what I found was that there's a lot fewer charging options available for batteries above, let's say, yeah. for anything above 60-ish volts or something like that. And there are power supplies that you can get that produce above that in a sort of benchtop power supply kind of a thing. But it's not just that. You also need to have something that's putting out a significant amount of amperage because you're talking about big batteries. And so it's not just, is your voltage good enough, but you have to feed all that power into it to fill them up in a reasonably fast amount of time. Right, um, right. So in the case of the 48-volt um, wooden boat, I guess we could, I, I should know how long it takes us to charge it, but maybe it takes about a day and a half or something. I forget how long it takes mm -hmm. with, the, with the power pack that we have. Um, but we actually put a level two charger in the trimaran. Um, and that was also part of the experience. We, we, the students wanted to be able to integrate that. Going back to the idea of promoting electric sure. propulsion, we wanted the boat to be able to feel to users like that it's a convenient, easy way to... So if you had to sort of like break out your special charger and hook on the alligator clips and right, it right, felt right. sketchy at all, you know? <laughs> and when you go from a 48-volt bank that it's sort of like, oh, that's cute, to like, you know, we're talking 144 volts. It's charging north of 160 or so volts. I think it's like 170. I forget where it, where it tops out at when it's fully charged. That's definitely not full around voltages, right, you know? Right. So you don't want to have anything where you're holding electric, you know, clamps and you're reaching in and clamping things on and all. All of the connections are all, you know, closed off, sealed off. Everything is not touchable, basically, yep. for safety reasons. And so to plug it in, um, we ended up using a 6.6 .6 kilowatt regular level two car charger that's mounted inside and... Um, then we have that. So we could have just taken that and coupled that with a some kind of a you know 220 volt outlet that we could plug into your some industrial type of socket that could handle that load. But instead, we ended up um, in, integrating a J1772 uh, actual term you know a, a outlet on it, so that oh, when you okay. plug in a regular car charger. Sure. And so in the shop where we do charge it. We just took a wall-mounted car charger and fitted it out with a, uh, what is it, a NEMA 1450, you know, outlet, because uh, we have an outlet that's right there with an extension cord that gives us the ability to plug it in, move it about 20 feet away, and then we have about 20 feet of the cord in this unit so we can have the boat somewhere in the building and not, like, right at the outlet and not, you know, have a little bit of flexibility. But the beauty of that is that, you know, let's say we were at PEP and it was a two-day competition, like in, like in right. April. If for some reason we wanted to be able to run it both days with full capacity, capacity, all we would need to do is take it to any place that has level two car charging and it'll it'll charge it to about 100% in six or so hours, which is great because it does 6.6 .6 kilowatts. Sure. Realistically, with, you know, with lithium batteries, that, that tapers off toward the end. So if we knew that we wanted every bit of that capacity, we would actually be waiting a little bit longer for it to be, you know, finishing and then topping that off. But, um, you know, that size battery is more than we would be able to use in a five mile race. Yeah. So, um, and so that's, that goes back to the battery selection and your motor controller combination and looking at what you've got. And maybe I should touch upon that a little bit more. Um, I know we talked a little bit about the outboards and I didn't talk as much about jet drives. I know we talked about the sure. pods and things like that. So right. jet drives is another thing I've seen some people using where it's an inboard motor unit, but the path of the water is sort of up through an impeller and then out through a jet drive. And the idea is that it's sort of a more, 
I don't know, sealed kind of a turnkey unit that can get installed and there's sort of less to worry about leaking and things like that. Um, I but, think they do have great advantages because like you're saying, like you do have to penetrate the hole, but it's in a very flat, epoxy-friendly uh, way that mm -hmm. uh, then you're controlling the same kind of motor, basically. Mm -hmm. But yeah. it's... It's now that the water's shooting out of the back, and you can yeah. again epoxy that pretty. Th and firmly. you don't have something that's sticking down out of the water, right? You can so still if have you had something profile. that this would be hitting as you're going along, um, but the downside to a jet drive is it still can suck stuff up <laughs> into the jet drive, <laughs> right. and so any debris that gets lodged in there, you got to figure out how to get it out, which may or may not be that hard to do, depending on what tools you have to sort of grab and pull things out. If you pull up a bunch of fishing string, that could be a nightmare because it could be all knotted and wrapped up all inside and may not necessarily be easy to extract it quickly you right, know, in a right, race scenario, right. you know. Um, but, um, but one of the things I guess that is that you need to think about, and this is, I should have mentioned this before, in talking about converting an outboard motor, one of the huge advantages that we felt about converting an outboard motor as opposed to coming up with an inboard motor solution is going back to that idea of how many variables are you changing in any given scenario. So if you are going to build from scratch a motor shaft prop combo in your boat, then you need to make sure that the motor is going to spin at an ideal RPM right. and it has an ideal torque and that the prop on the other end has got the ideal pitch and diameter and the number of blades and whatever profile and things like that, that all together, that's a good combo. And that's the kind of thing that you can work with a supplier of, yeah. of a lot of, you know, sort of um, kits for the marine industry, and they'll be able to walk you through that. But if you're going into any kind of a DIY approach where you're pulling the motor out of a treadmill or it's sort of a more industrial motor, you may not find that those answers are as easy to get to to tie all these things together. And so you might be able to talk to the seller of a propeller, and then they would say, this typically fits on a X horsepower motor, and those may have this much you know, torque or something like that. They might right. be able to help you equate what size prop would be ideal for your motor. But the bottom line is, is that you need to make sure that those things are all matched. And the beauty of using an outboard motor that you've converted is that it's sort of built into the, you know, we, so with our trimaran, it's an older 50 horsepower two-stroke outboard motor. So we know that it generates about 50 horsepower, and we know that from the manual that the motor spins, I forget if it's like 5,500 RPMs or something like that. So our target was to find a motor that could fit on top of it and would spin at around 5,500 RPMs and would be able to produce at least as much torque, but not significantly more than right. what it was already doing. Um, and the reason I say not significantly more is because uh, if, you've got a, if you've got an overage of torque, you can make up for that and take advantage of that by increasing the pitch of your propeller. But if you do that to a degree, well, there's only so many propeller pitch options that you can get to begin with. Mm -hmm. But if you were to say dramatically increase the pitch of your propeller, maybe make a custom prop or figure out some way to adapt a bigger prop or something that is meant to be on that lower unit, um, you are potentially putting a lot more stress on the, the gears in your lower unit, yep. and you might find that those are prone to failing for some reason, um, you know, because of the strain on them or something like that. Yeah, and so, teams have found some cavitation issues already. Yeah, and we've got I some cavitation issues right now, yeah. It's probably very low down on the list of, like, things to worry about in the mm -hmm. beginning part of the design, mm -hmm. but you might find down the road that, like, yeah. propeller adjustments are necessary. Yeah.